morning. Good morning, Green Maryland. Yay! Mike, thank you so much for that warm introduction. I think we have to start by taking a moment to honor Mike Tidwell and all that he has done. Whether, whether it's jumping into the icy cold Potomac every January uh, to make a statement on climate change, or getting arrested in front of the White House in opposition to the Keystone XL pipeline. You, Mike, have been the environmental conscience of Maryland, and I thank you from the depths of my heart for the leadership that you have given to all of us on being able to make a change and a better environment for us and generations to follow. So thank you so much, Mike. Sponsoring organizations, Interfaith Power and Light, Physicians for Social Responsibility, Environment Maryland, and the NAACP. The power of all of these organizations coming together and reminding us that the issues uh, revolving around fracking uh, go beyond the environment and are a core concern to faith leaders, public health providers, and advocates for economic justice alike. And thank you to my colleagues who are here. Bless you. Uh, Senator Bill Ferguson from uh, Baltimore is here. And I know that uh, my colleague from District 20, uh, Senator Jamie Raskin, will be here this afternoon if he's not already. And I have to give special recognition. I'm not sure if he's here, but Delegate Shane Robinson has shown a deep interest and dedicated leadership on fracking as a member of the House Environmental Matters Committee and has been a, a really great colleague to fight on this fight. Thank you to our friends from Western Maryland who are here today and made the trek uh, to be here. As you'll soon learn, this fight first and foremost belongs to them. Fracking is an issue that affects them it affects our entire state, but our Western Maryland friends, it's really up close and personal. Their courage to stand up and be heard in their communities and to say no and take the long view at a time when many of their neighbors did uh, what they wanted um, to say yes for short-term gain has really been what has led us through the wilderness on this issue, and they are my heroes on this fight. Thank you for being here today. If Maryland is going to be different, if we are not going to be in other Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West Virginia, it's going to be because of the people here in this room. And we aren't gonna have the most money in this fight. No matter how persuasive Mike and, and his colleagues are in getting us to dig deep in our pockets and fund Environment Maryland and CCAN, Halliburton and Interplus and Chevron are always going to have deeper pockets than us. They are always going to outspend us. They are always going to be the ones with the special interest lobbyists in the back room. But we've got you. And that matters. Because we're going to have your tenacity and your determination. We have your voices and your votes. We have your dedication and your commitment. And I can't thank you enough for engaging with us in this fight because this is how we are going to take on big issues and win. We are, we are going to be in a historic position to have Maryland continue to be the only state that sits on shale gas rock and isn't rushing headfirst into drilling without asking questions. We're setting a pragmatic course for how this should be done, or whether it should be done at all in Maryland. And we have an amazing and unique opportunity before us. It's not often that we as environmental advocates have an opportunity to uh, affect change before something bad happens and we're just trying to clean up a mess, right? Can Love Canal, yeah. Cuyahoga River, Superfund, Exxon Valdez, deep water horizon, climate change itself. The common thread in all of these is that it's usually some wealthy corporate interest that's trying to um, search out cheap energy or easy profits without regard to our planet. And 
even in our fight to bring offshore wind to Maryland, uh, which is so critical to our energy future, and we're going to win that one too in 2013 because of you. Even that fight is about reversing damage that has already been caused. But with fracking, we have an opportunity to make sure that that damage never even happens. And we've all heard the stories from other states. But let's take stock of what's at risk right here in Maryland. Small business owners in Garrett County rely on this land for their livelihood. Farmers run first generation vineyards or have goats for amazing goat cheese uh, and farm fresh dairy and, and livestock options. Garrett's growing ecotourism industry relies on fresh air and clean water for hiking in the Great Allegheny Passage and swimming in Deep Creek Lake. When my wife Deborah and I travel to Garrett and stand on the mountain at Deep Creek Cellars, we gaze at uninterrupted mountains for as far as the eye can see. Imagine dotting that landscape with drilling rigs. <coughs> if tourism is the root of Western Maryland's economy, then home building is the trunk and the branches. Second home construction was putting people to work and providing a steady stream of tax revenue until the prospect of fracking drove down property values. For the vast majority of Western Maryland homeowners without mineral rights, they'll likely be left holding an empty bag, not a million dollar windfall. Homeowners in already heavily fracked northeastern Pennsylvania cannot refinance their homes cannot get home, uh, home improvement loans because it's considered too risky. Some lifelong residents and realtors cannot sell a home in Western Maryland right now because homeowners are less willing to invest in properties that could be sitting next to a 24 hour a day operation of drilling under an unregulated fracking environment. And we all know the purely environmental risks associated with fracking, illegal dumps and streams, methane air pollution, radioactive frack waste. And frackers say that these risks are worth it for our economy. They paint us as environmentalists who don't care about our economic future. But ask a vineyard owner or a construction, in West, construction worker and contractor in Western Maryland what they think about the potential risks and trade-offs are and whether their concerns have anything to do with the local economy. In Western Maryland, the economy and the environment are as tied together as a canoe and a paddle. And we can see the warning signs and the risks. Only now we have the opportunity to act first. We have the opportunity to act first. We have the chance to make sure that Maryland does not repeat the mistakes of our neighboring states. We will not drill first and ask questions later. We know that second chances are expensive and that we have to get it right the first time. And so, just like any fracking well though, the pressure is building. Well financed gas companies are knocking on our door and they're ready to push the gas pedal. And thankfully for the last two years, we've been able to stop them. But will that hold? Two years ago, I sat down and read an article in the Baltimore Sun by a gas industry scientist who said, Maryland had vast economic potential locked under our mountains and streams, miles and miles below. He said, once Maryland got into the fracking game, the jobs and the cheap energy would flow and all of our problems would be gone. Of course, he made no mention of flammable tap water or fatal well blowouts. The way he talked about trading Maryland's natural resources for economic gain with no consideration given to the impact on our environment or communities was frightening. And I also learned that Western Maryland already had been leased for drilling. 150,000 acres had already been leased, as a matter of fact, and there were five permits sitting on the desk of a regulator in Annapolis waiting to be approved. And yet, none of my colleagues and almost no one in Annapolis even knew what Marcellus Shale was at the time. So I thought, whew, we better get to educating some folks on this. I wrote an op-ed that appeared in, an editorial that appeared in the Baltimore Sun, highlighting my concerns and calling on Maryland to slow down, 
take a time out on fracking until we had more information about whether it could be done safely. And in less than a week, I was out in Friendship, Maryland in Garrett County meeting with Eric Robeson, Smokey Stanton, Paul Roberts, Nadine Gravania, and other Western Marylanders who were desperate for anyone outside of Garrett County to notice the fracking steamroller headed straight for the land that they so dearly loved. In what has been an action-packed two years since, we have made great strides. In 2011, our legislative efforts to halt the rush to drill and study before any permits were approved led to the creation of the Marcellus Shale Safe Drilling Commission. In just six months, through the hard work and advocacy and sheer tenacity from many of you, we successfully called a timeout on Maryland. The commission was established by an executive order from the governor, and it was tasked with conducting a comprehensive study of natural gas drilling in Maryland and is required to report on its findings by the summer of 2014. I'm one of the governor's 14 commissioners. Establishing the, committee to, the commission to study fracking before a drill even touches the ground was a critical first step for Maryland to take. Other states, as we've said, with shale gas rocks solved dollar signs and rushed to drill. And only after they realized the mess that they had on their hands did they choose to take a closer look. And Maryland is already leading by calling for this timeout. But what's a study without the money to fund it? Without dedicated resources to assure a comprehensive, robust, scientific, and independent review, we only have a study in theory. While the industry could not stop our efforts to create a, 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 create a study, they were able to stop any effort to fund it. Right now, our study and much of the work of the commission is really just a paper tiger because we don't have the resources to back the promise of what we are asking and being asked to do in this study. So our solution then and our solution now is this, that the industry must pay for this study. For two years, we, we've told the industry, you want to drill in Maryland, then pay up front to help us determine whether it can be done safely. The industry stands to make millions of dollars in profit from extracting these natural resources. That's probably Drew Cobbs from the API right now trying to interrupt. <laughs> They say that America could be the Saudi Arabia of natural gas. They can afford catchy TV commercials during the Super Bowl nonetheless to show green pastures and blue waterways and make you think that fracking is okay. Yet they can't come up with a mere $2 million to help us fund these important studies. It makes you wonder, what are they worried that we are going to find out? They oppose the funding idea because of the precedent that it sets for an industry to have to fund safety studies before they're allowed to have business in the state. But when the alternative is poisoned drinking water and communities changed for generations, that's a precedent that I'm more than willing to set. The onus, the onus should be on the industry and not the taxpayers to pay for these underlying studies and to make sure that we have the best resources necessary to do it right in our own. So as we look to 2013, this conference could not come at a more critical time because we are slowly but surely reaching a decision point on fracking in Maryland. Only we don't have all the facts that we need. We created the study in 2011, which is slated to conclude in 2014, but without funding, without the resources necessary to do the rigorous safety studies, it will never meet its goals of providing a thorough, complete, scientific examination of whether Maryland should track. And contrary to popular belief, there is no current ban or moratorium on drilling. The governor's executive order granted a helpful temporary reprieve but, re but provides no permanent or guaranteed protection against unregulated drilling. At best, it has served as a de facto moratorium. But if the oil and gas industry decided tomorrow that it would sue the state to force a decision on issuing the permits, we are uncertain whether or not the executive order could withstand legal scrutiny. So we need to be very, very clear in the law. 
And what happens if, when we have a new governor in 2015? If he or she signs off on fracking, and our study is starved of funding until its conclusion, then there's nothing to stop drilling from commencing with little or no regulatory standards in place. I mean, the last time that our drilling regulations were taking a look on the books and updated, fracking wasn't even a twinkle in Dick Cheney's eye yet. <laughs> We've got a lot of work to do to get to a place of deciding, even if we were to do this, even if it could be done safely, what are the safeguards that need to be in place to assure that? The answer is going to be in this 2013 legislative session, an ironclad drilling moratorium that prevents the state from issuing any permits until a thorough study is complete. And, and after the study is complete, after the state agencies have been able to properly assign a risk assessment to each study category, then the General Assembly, not environmental groups, not the state agencies, not the industry, but the General Assembly itself will have to review line by line that study and those risk assessments and make a decision from there. Do we lift the moratorium? Do we institute a complete ban? Or do we come back and require further study on, on issues that we need even more information on in order to determine Maryland's future? We are putting the industry on notice that their cynical ploy to block funding for the safety studies and just wait out the clock on the commission's time frame in order to then just be able to get the permits at the end of this 2014 period is not going to give them what they're looking for. We won't do that. We are going to be very, very clear that in the state of Maryland, no studies means no fracking. And make no mistake, this will not happen without you. I'm not saying this because it's a good line in a speech at a fracking conference. <laughs> I'm personally asking each and every one of you to make this fight your own this year. Because that is how we are gonna win. Each year, the natural gas industry's special interest footprint in Annapolis continues to grow. They hire more and more lobbyists with more and more influence on key decision makers that lock up our good efforts in the Senate. There's no end to the money that the API and the oil and gas industry will spend to thwart the democratic process. They've doubled down and said they're ready to fight. And the only way we're gonna beat their influence is through the power of citizen advocacy, through the power of you. With your help, we're building a grassroots movement, the like of which Annapolis has never seen. And we can, we will prevail because I do know and believe in my core that you are going to take ownership over the outcome of this. Seeing you here today gives me great hope for the future of our planet. But don't let today be the pinnacle of your involvement on this issue. Email, call, tweet your legislators. I noticed in the, in the, in the program for today, CCAN's always great about what your action items are. You've got a take home cheat sheet in your program under the Get Involved page that makes recommendations on how you can join our movement. Call your neighbors and relatives and give them tutorials on how to do the same. Take the ideas and the stories that you're going to hear today and spread them across this great state. Nadine Gravania, a farmer, a co-owner, and operator of a vineyard in Garrett County that is threatened by fracking, recently sent me a note that ended with this. Every time I enjoy something beautiful on our hillside, the wind, the smell of the rain, hearing crickets through open windows, I think about what you have done to save it. Many, many thanks. We really can't say it enough. And as Nadine knows all too well, the fight isn't over. And I need to know if you are ready to be a member of that army 
to fight to protect Nadine's hillside. Remember the unique opportunity that we have. We can keep something bad from ever, ever happening. We can do this. We can take ownership of our political system again and fight the special interest and win. When you take control over it, when you take ownership of it, and when you agree to fight for it. And so with you, we are going to get this moratorium done in 2013. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart as well. <laughs>